Hello everybody, good afternoon and welcome to the session Motivational Strategies, Keeping Students Engaged in Real and Virtual Classrooms with our speaker Joanna Dossiter. And thank you very much for joining us. Um, please remember that during the talk there's a question and answer function available, so feel free to post your questions and comments there. Um, Caroline and I are also in the studio today as moderators and we will collect and send your questions to the presenter towards the end of the session um, when they will have time to answer them. So feel free to like any question that you want the speaker to focus on and we'll do our best to field as many as we can, time permitting. OK, so now I'd like to introduce our speaker, Joanna Dossiter. She's a senior teacher at the British Council of Barcelona. She has over 20 years experience of teaching and teacher training, and her particular interests are best practice in young learner teaching and in teachers continuing professional development. OK, so I'll pass over to you now, Joanna. That's great. Thank you very much, Lisa, and welcome everybody who's listening to this talk. Um, and if you uh, were listening to Graham Stanley's plenary, you might well have a fork that you're waving at the screen, um, but I can't see that, unfortunately. So let's get started. So this talk is divided into three parts, uh, setting off the journey and holding the vision. Um, what's in it for me? Uh, what will you get out of this? Well, uh, hopefully 10 practical teaching ideas that you can use in your classes. Um, I have put the handout for the session at this QR code. You might want to take a screenshot, but you can also get it at the Padlet. So just firstly, why motivation? Um, 2020 has been a very atypical year for all of us, incredibly challenging year all over the world. Um, and motivation is the energy that can support resilience and optimism. So I think it's a good moment for motivation. So part one, setting off. So I'd like to start with introduction. Um, as Lisa just said, I work at the British Council Barcelona. Um, and motivational quote number one. Uh, this is hanging up in our hallway. My colleague Gemma has put up this lovely display and nothing is impossible. The word itself says I'm possible. So something briefly about me. Um, I'm originally from Kings Lynn in Norfolk and some of the things that motivate me are travel, walking, yoga and new learning in general. These are the objectives of the session and um, hopefully we'll have time to cover all of these. So first of all, I would suggest that um, as we go through the talk, you maybe have a little notebook or you just scribble down a few things uh, because I think being active helps um, helps learning. So what words come to mind when you think of motivation? I'm just going to wait a few seconds while you find a notebook and a pen, scribble down a few words or just make um, a mental note. So here are some words that you might have been thinking of. You might have thought of extrinsic, intrinsic, um, achievement, goal, enjoyment, um, journey, something like that. So another um, just quick activity, I'd like you to think of a teacher who motivated you maybe in the past or maybe even a teacher that's motivating you now. So what is or was it about this teacher that was motivating? And here I'd like you to type something in the chat. I can't see the chat at the moment, but when we stop a third of the way through the journey, um, I'll ask Lisa and Caroline if they can uh, tell me some of the things that you've put in the chat. Now, when um, myself and my colleague Gemma did a, a version of this talk a little bit earlier in the year with British Council teachers, um, we did a, gave them a Google form and the results of the three top three factors came out like this. So the ability to build positive relationships, to create a safe and stimulating classroom environment and purposeful and. Um, oh. Sorry. Um, I was just moving something that I could see on my screen and because uh, I couldn't see the word relevant, that's why uh, I froze there. Sorry, purposeful, purposeful and relevant teaching. Um, you might have noted that this teacher that motivated you showed an interest in your learning, gave you feedback, was perhaps good humoured, funny or entertaining, um, explained things clearly and made you curious and made the subject relevant. So we're going to look a little bit at the theoretical framework um, to motivation. 
So one of these frameworks is self-determination theory, um, which suggests that humans have three basic needs. And one of those is relatedness, the need to have a close affectionate relationships with others. The other one is autonomy, the need to control the course of our lives. And the third one is competence, the need to be effective in dealing with the environment. And competence, I think we can also here equate with confidence. So there are many motivational theories. We won't go deeply into any of them, but you may well be thinking of the theories of intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. So intrinsic is behavior driven by internal rewards or internal choice, um, choiceful behavior and rises within the individual. But ex extrinsic motivation is referring to behavior that's more driven by external rewards, um, typically grades or praise or money or, or prestige. And these link to other concepts. So the intrinsic motivation may be linked to integrative motivation, learners wanting to get to know people who speak the L2 and really be motivated by that other culture. Um, and extrinsic motivation related to instrumental motivation of wanting to um, perhaps pass, ex pass an exam or get a job or, or maybe move abroad. Um, and in a way, we probably typically relate um, adults more typically to the uh, to the intrinsic um, motivation and teens perhaps more to the extrinsic. Um, so adults who, after all, are literally investing in their learning, they have chosen to pay for it. Um, teens, their parents will be the ones probably who've decided on on this uh, course of action. So uh, adults generally may be more successful at self-motivation, teens may be less skilled at self-regulation and motivation. But there are similarities and both of them need to be engaged. Um, and engagement is a really critical concept that we'll come back to in the talk. Um, both groups can easily be distracted and they need to be kept um, interested and on task. I would argue both need uh, relatedness, the need to feel connected, they need autonomy, to have some freedom and choice. And here I think it's interesting if you uh, were watching Leslie Keith's I Wonder talk earlier this morning, she was mentioning just the importance for young learners to have control over their environment. Um, and competence, uh, the need to feel effective and confident about your ability to do something. You know? And it's kind of like this idea of this powerful message of yes I can, um, is this idea of self-efficacy. So I would argue that the characteristics of motivating teachers are that they build trust and relationships. They empower students by helping them to feel confident and competent and they build autonomy and they allow choices. And we'll come back brief, briefly to this later, but here is another acronym that I think is quite helpful. It's uh, John Keller's ARCS model. Um, and those uh, acronym, the acronym stands for attention, relevance, confidence, and satisfaction. So finally, the last uh, theoretical uh, sort of framework for this talk is Zoltan Dernier, and I will um, refer to Zoltan repeatedly in this talk. I, I find um, his books extremely readable and uh, very helpful in, in the classroom. Um, and it's this book, Motivational Strategies in the Language Classroom. So, um, one of the things that Zoltan points out is that um, language learning needs motivation because it's such a long process. It's uh, during the lengthy and often tedious process of mastering the foreign or second language, the learner's enthusiasm, commitment and persistence are key determinants of success or failure. So um, Dernier has the, uh, an idea of a process approach to motivation that, it, that covers distinct phases. Um, first of all, creating the basic motivational conditions, then generating the initial motivation, then maintaining and protecting it, and finally retrospectively evaluating it. And this is summarised here in this nice image um, of this cycle. So what are these motivational teaching strategies? And that is the title of this talk. Um, so in this session, we will look at 10 practical activities. So first of all, pack, packing for the journey. OK, creating the basic motivational conditions. Um, we need to create a pleasant and supportive atmosphere in class. We need to demonstrate and model appropriate teacher behaviours. And we need to create a cohesive learner group with appropriate group norms. So here is motivational teaching idea number one. 
actively learn about your students, record the information and then recycle it back into your class. So this is um, a nice form uh, or, or sort of worksheet um, that I got from a session given by uh, the teacher trainer, Chris Rowland. So thanks, Chris, very much for this idea. I still have this bit of paper uh, at home. And um, this is very useful for just keeping notes on your students so that you, you have this information and you can refer back to it. Um, and I would say that it's, it's nice to refer back to this information and recycle it. So you can recycle it into the class um, as a kind of find someone who now, in the new socially distanced world, the find someone who will need some adaptation, there's no question. Um, but I think to some extent, uh, the teacher can highlight these or put these up on the board and say, um, who is the person who? Uh, and read out uh, the things and encourage the, the other students to recognise these features or these characteristics of each other. And therefore, they will learn about their other um, classmates. It's important to involve all students and invite them all to participate actively. And this helps to develop a cohesive learner group, which is which is really important. Um, and I think I would also say here that um, we do have quieter students in our classes and um, it's quite important to actually draw those out. I think as a teacher, that, that is our role to make sure that all students are contributing. Um, and I think there's an interesting book related to this, which is the book Quiet, um, about these quieter students, more introverted and how to uh, make sure that their voice is, is also heard. So one way you can do this very simply is to use a website such as Wheel of Names. You type in the names of your students and you keep um, getting a random student to participate. Um, and another very nice website is this one, app.classroomscreen, which has a uh, random name generator included in it, as well as a whole, of other, a whole load of other features. And this is very nice to use online when you're teaching online, um, but also good to use in the face-to-face the, uh, the -face, uh, classroom. So motivational teaching idea um, number three is to establish clear group norms at the start of the year. Um, so, for example, um, you're, as a teacher, you're, you're almost bound to say everybody needs to speak in English in the English classroom. Um, but also it's very good to factor in choice and autonomy and ask the students for their own ideas about the class and even possibly to make um, make some rules for the teacher. And that might be that the teacher needs to hand back um, their work within, let's say, perhaps a week at the very latest. So what about motivation in the virtual world? How is this similar and, or different? And Graham was speaking just before this about um, virtual learning environments and the things to bear in mind. Um, and some of those things are very similar to the face to face classroom, um, but some of them are perhaps a little bit um, a little bit different or, or more emphasis. So um, this is a very interesting website I would recommend. I've put this uh, link to a handout that I will um, that I will share with you at, at the end, the, the where to find the handout. Um, but there are a number of different videos about motivating and engaging students um, online. And uh, one thing they stress is the importance of teacher presence. Um, and they say how important it is for the teacher to make your presence felt, particularly at the start of a course where there's an initial socialisation period. Um, and so that it's it's important to interact as much as you can with the students. Um, and that might be physically when you're in your in your um, in your virtual class, but also asynchronously. Hi, Jill. Sorry to interrupt. And um, we just had a couple of um, people asking if you would mind just slowing down a little bit so they can take in the information. Yes, thank you, Lisa, for um, for saying that. Yes, I'm aware that I'm going pretty fast. So um, just because I'm probably have put too much in this talk, but I will slow down. I, I will also say that all of these slides um, I have shared as well on the on the Padlet. Um, so they will be there for later, but I will slow down. Thank you for okay, that. OK, no um, problem. For mentioning that. No problem. Thank you, Jill. Um, the, for the participants as well, please remember that you can watch a recording of this afterwards. OK, thank you. So um, to come back to what we were saying about norms, um, it's a, a ground rule or a norm in a, in a virtual learning environment is perhaps to establish how much participation that you're expecting from the students and maybe um, giving them some criteria and tying this into your assessment. Um, 
and online in particular, um, the, the teacher has perhaps a new role, which is that of the community manager. So more than ever, the role of the facilitator, the teacher as facilitator is really, really important um, to create the sense of community, which really does tie students together and 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 heightens their motivation and enthusiasm to continue with with a course. So um, one thing about an online learning community that is um, perhaps another but different is to well not necessarily different but an online learning community can be even more democratic um, in that it does seem to involve and give voice to perhaps a wider range of personality types um, and it may be that less vocal students may actually find it easier to participate more actively and contribute more. So that's the end of part one. Um, I'm sorry if I've galloped through it, um, but at, that, at this point, if um, Lisa and Caroline have any questions or comments to share, then this would be a good moment just to to look at them. Well, Joe, in, in response to your, your question about what motivates uh, what teachers motivate them, what are the qualities in a teacher, a word that comes up a lot is passion. Uh, it's repeated several times through the chat, passion about the subject, love of what they're teaching, um, kindness, friendliness, and uh, something that you referred to very strongly there about the can-do attitude. Okay, it came up as well about a teacher who makes you feel that you can, can achieve. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, absolutely. I think, you know, the enthusiasm of a teacher is definitely carried into the class and carries the students along. Um, kindness and caring is very important from a teacher. Um, and also this, you know, that the teacher has a belief that you can do something um, will really help to convince the students. And then they'll have this sense of self-efficacy that um, that without it, they may well give up. OK, um, we'll carry on into part two, but I will pause again after part two for more questions. OK, so part two, the journey. And uh, here we're going to look at generating initial motivation, maintaining it and protecting it. So what's in it for me, this journey? Um, I would say that if you can successfully generate enthusiasm and motivation at the start of a course, then you're a long way towards guaranteeing the success of the students uh, on that language learning journey with you, possibly for the next year or, or longer. And what you might see I was trying to do there was to basically sell it, sell it to you. Yeah, sell it to you why you might be listening to this, what's in it for you. Um, and I think that's something that a teacher can do is to um, point out the relevance of what uh, what you're doing in the class um, and also um, make it engaging and, and interesting so that the students really want to. To, to pay attention. Um, and engagement has been called by different writers as uh, the holy grail of learning, um, which suggests it is not the easiest thing to, to, to find. So motivational teaching idea number four is to increase your students' goal-orientedness. So how can you do this? So it's important to set goals. Um, or encourage students to set their own goals. So one thing you can do as a group is to negotiate class goals. Um, the other thing is to find out what your students' goals are, and they may all have different goals, which again, if you can um, individualize and personalize the learning, that will be that will be motivating. Um, and then to show students explicitly how the class activities are related to their own goals, because I think the problem sometimes is that learners don't really know what the teacher what the teacher has in mind with these with the activities that they're planning and um, if you can share that with them then um, they can see that there's really a point so share class objectives frequently at the beginning of the class you can have a class menu up on the board um, and also share the criteria for success which will help learners to identify when they've done something well you can also ask learners to per periodically reflect on their own goals. They might do this in a, in a learning journal. And I think one thing to say this year, we've been talking about how we're going to be teaching in a socially distanced um, classroom. This is uh, we're starting our classes, uh, the British Council very soon. And um, 
I think perhaps this year we will find that there will be more moments for sort of individual work or where um, we might be focusing a little bit more on um, students individual work. So to write in a learning journal in a classroom, I would suggest is a good use of class time, even though it's an individual moment. Um, I think there's there's work going on. Students are thinking and reflecting and that's although you can't see it is is actually useful learning. So what about maintaining motivation? So um, motivational teaching idea number five is to break the learning down into achievable chunks. Um, and again, just to go back to what Leslie Keast was saying this morning um, in her talk, I wonder, uh, she was talking about the kind of structured frameworks that that really help um, to sort of break the learning down and make it achievable. And we can look at this as a kind of a problem solving approach. And I think it's also worth mentioning that uh, students with additional educational needs um, particularly benefit from this. So if they have attention deficit and hyperactivity disorder or Asperger's or dyslexia, if the teacher provides that structure and keeps them checking what they're what they're what they're doing and what they're what, what those steps are, breaking it down into the steps, um, it makes it a lot more achievable. Learning is uh, problem solving and uh, neuroscience apparently shows that similar areas of the brain activate for both learning and pleasure and this is to do with the sort of dopamine reward circuit um, because when we solve a problem then we get a hit of dopamine which um, can make us uh, as another talk I was listening to earlier about habits it makes us maybe crave this but it can be a positive thing obviously um, but the point is being able to solve the problem and uh, this I'm sure you are familiar already with the cheek sent me high flow theory um, but it's very much about the um, the key Goldilocks level between um, boredom and anxiety if something is too easy we get very bored easily but if it's too difficult we get anxious um, and the kind of the the zone to aim at is the the zone between those two um, and game design works very much on this theory that we we have a, a little problem, we solve it, uh, we get the kind of moments of mastery and self-efficacy, and then we move on to a new challenge. So I think this is exploited in many kinds of, of games. So the motivational teaching idea number six is about the content of the course. Um, so just to consider the nutritional content of your instruction um, in order to make this relevant and to make it varied. So I think the relationship here with food is that, you know, we we, we need the food that, that's good for us and that will um, give us nutrition. But if it's always the same, it's incredibly dull. So variety is, is super important in teaching. Um, how can we make the learning relevant for the students? Well, one way is to do needs analysis regularly, and this can be just simple feedback. And it can be um, the kind of feedback that's, you know, yes, I like it mm, or I don't. It can be very visual, immediate like that, or it can be using, for example, um, in the online world, we can use Google Forms, we can use Microsoft Forms, we can use SurveyMonkey, and we can get really excellent um, feedback from doing that. Um, and sometimes beautifully graphically displayed. And at which point I uh, just highlight that I'll share this with you at the end of the talk because I would like uh, your feedback at the end. I'll come back to this slide. Um, so how about variety? How can you introduce variety in your teaching? So I'm just going to pause. Um, I'm sorry if I'm going fast again, but I'm just going to pause at this point and um, ask you to uh, jot down perhaps in the chat how you can introduce variety in in the classroom, either the face to face classroom or the virtual classroom. I have a few suggestions here, so I think you can vary the topic. I think you can use games and quizzes and jokes and use humour uh, in general. Also vary the, the person who provides the content and you can ask students to bring in content with student presentations. And actually about three months ago, one of my students online uh, did a really excellent presentation all about um, the coronavirus because his uh, parents and relatives were working in hospitals and um, it was really, really well done. And all of his peers were incredibly interested uh, and actually learned a lot about coronavirus from it. 
So online games that you can play to break up the monotony of the learning. Kahoot, I think we all know Kahoot very well by now. Also Bamboozle is another quiz um, tool and Quizlet is excellent um, also. Other ways we vary the skills work, uh, we can vary settling and stirring activities. Again, in a socially distanced classroom, this may get more difficult, but at the very least we can do, Simon says, in our chairs, we can stand up, we can sit down, we can um, do some kind of stirring. We can vary the input and we can vary pair work, group work and individual work. Um, protecting motivation. So one writer has talked about guarding against everyday dragons and everyday dragons are things like distractions. They are things like, um, you know, other activities that get in the way. And, and certainly in, in today's world with so many um, digital devices that are constantly pulling us in all directions. And I think teenagers we know are incredibly pulled in all directions. So protecting motivation is important. Um, so motivational teaching idea number seven is to use collaborative group work to energize students and um, they learn from each other. And it also develops the group's cohesion, which in itself um, provides more motivation. And here online environments are, are great because there are so many tools that we can use to group together students contrib contributions. Um, I know a lot of uh, teachers in the state system are using Google Classroom, which is an amazing tool. Um, we can create wiki pages, blogs. Uh, we can ask students to work together on online presentations. There are many ways that students can collaborate. And create the virtual learning community. Another um, idea which is very helpful in group work is to give students different roles. So what kind of roles could students have if, if they're working in a group and we want to divide them up? Well, uh, I've got some examples here. So for example, um, this role, a timekeeper role, is, is, a, is a pretty good one. Uh, and it's helpful to have just one person in charge of that. Also, we can have um, an ideas generator, so somebody who maybe not just one person, more than one person who's who's doing that. Um, other roles, we might have our secretary or um, idea generator or I sorry, idea evaluator or somebody who's the devil's advocate or somebody uh, who's the noise monitor that can be helpful in in busy classes and busy schools, um, a summarizer or a graphic designer. And I would suggest having the roles on a lanyard, I think is 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 good because you've got a physical reminder of what your role is. And then it's very easy just to swap the roles around the next time and have variety. Just to come back to the idea of communities and online environments, this is an example of Flipgrid. And I asked a friend of mine to uh, to to record uh, her opinion about a motivating teacher um, and I'm going to build on this as well with with other friends. So um, in Flipgrid, a whole load of different students can record um, a video response. So that's the end of part two. Um, I hope I didn't gallop through too quickly and now is again a moment for questions or comments. Hi Joe. Yeah, we've uh, got lots of suggestions and comments again. Um, with suggestions for introducing variety through different media, different realia, as some practical examples. People are interested in hearing about practical examples like grab and grab and gab, show and tell, using the five senses. There's lots of lots of ideas came up there. Um, a question came up a couple of times, which which you have touched on, but it's obviously a key a key question about the difficulties because of COVID uh, and the restrictions and how that's going to impact on on the fun element and, and so on. So that came up. Uh, somebody who somebody sorry, I can't remember who now mentioned the difficulty even you just using masks um, and that might provoke some shyness or so that those were the comments and questions. The question we've got here is how can we make that work 
with within those restrictions as well? Yeah, I think that's a very good question and I, and I have to say I don't have the answer and I, I feel apprehensive as I think a lot of us do. Um, I was in a training session yesterday about this and most of us were voicing our apprehension. One nice idea that one teacher had was to ask the students to bring in um, a photo of themselves and put it on their desk, fold it over, put their name and that way um, all the learners can see each other's faces mm -hmm. um, because obviously they'll be covered up with the mask oh. but then they've got the photo there. Um, and then again the importance for the teacher to personalise things so perhaps to to bring in photos show them on the screen of themselves you know their families things that are important to them and just although we we may feel anonymous because of the masks to try and personalize that as much as possible so i think images and photos might be a good way around that yeah okay yes thanks OK, so we're going to move on to to part three and hopefully um, at the end of this there'll also be time for a couple of other questions as well so this part is divided into the L2 future self, group glee and the mindset. So I'm going to refer again to Zoltan Dernier um, in this book, Motivation, Language, Identity and the L2 self. Um, and this is a very nice uh, YouTube talk that I would recommend about uh, this topic, motivating L2 learners and teachers through vision. So what is this vision idea and, and how does it work exactly? So Dernier, um explains and argues persuasively that the use of imagery and vision is very powerful and is currently being used in uh, and widely used in coaching high performing athletes and sportsmen and women. So this is being used because it does work. Um, and the idea is that if the learners can visualize themselves as succeeding in their L2 language journey, then they're going to be energized in the present to continue. And in that sense that the seeing in the mind's eye is believing. And I think this incredible example of this is from uh, my favorite documentary, Man on Wire. And here we see Philip Petit uh, walking between the Twin Towers and he actually um, in, in a dentist surgery saw a drawing of the Twin Towers. Um, many years before and he tore out the drawing because it inspired him so much and he knew he was going to do this, um, this, this incredible um, feat that he, that he achieved to walk between the Twin Towers. I think that just shows the power of vision. Um, so how, again, does the idea work? Well, I think this, I believe this anyway, I'm not a neuroscientist, but uh, the dopamine reward circuit is that we're transported into the future and we experience pleasure in the in the present as we contemplate the vision. And in a way, if we think in English, we, we look forward to something. And in Spanish, nos hace ilusión, this idea of nos hace ilusión. Now we've got it in the mind. Um, but what could this look like in the classroom itself? So here I would like to thank Ollie Jones in the British Council Madrid Teaching Centre who um, explored this with a community of practice and a group of teachers. And um, so his uh, ideas that he shared with us are vision boards, visualisation and future self letters. So what is a vision board? A vision board is something that, um, that, that, that learners um, produce as a kind of collage of themselves in the future. So for example, this learner here um, is imagining themselves in 10 years time, living in New York City, holidaying in Australia, passing the proficiency exam, um, running their own business, um, and all of these things that they can achieve once they've got really good English. Um, so I think that could be a really interesting thing to try out with, with your students. Um, Another idea is to do a guided visualisation and this is a little bit more touchy feely and it's not perhaps everybody's cup of tea. Um, but I think that the idea is that the teacher would have some kind of script and would ask learners to imagine perhaps with their eyes closed uh, themselves in the future and, and very much adding sensory details of seeing themselves projected into the future. What does it look like? What does it feel like? And the third idea is to ask the learners to imagine themselves in the future writing a letter to their current selves once that they've succeeded what uh, letter of advice would they would they write to themselves so i think that's also a very nice idea so we move on to the next part group group glee um, so glee or happiness celebration it's it's important to to celebrate success um, and important to find and make the most of opportunities to celebrate progress and success. So this is motivational teaching idea number nine. 
Um, and what do we mean exactly by progress and success? Um, just to come back <laughs> again to the dopamine reward circuit, um, pleasure and enjoyment. This is why we get addicted to Facebook likes. These positive reinforcements, they keep us hooked on the experience. Um, so, for example, receiving positive feedback is, is really important. And I think one of the most motivational teach, mo one of the most motivational things that a teacher can do is to give uh, positive feedback to students. And um, also to recognize and acknowledge strengths. And um, I remember um, a colleague of mine saying how much she appreciated um, a peer observation program where her peers basically said how good she was at, at, at certain aspects of teaching. And she said she felt this was like a pat on the back that she she didn't usually get. Um, so if somebody's acknowledging our strengths, it definitely gives us a massive boost. Um, Another thing, other things we can do is to um, very simple level is we have our class goals on the menu and we, we tick them off and we show the, the learners what they've achieved in that lesson. Um, doing a collaborative project and finishing it and getting uh, praise and feedback. Um, even as something as simple as doing well in a class Kahoot, um, passing an exam and, and playing a team game, uh, which is fun in itself, even if we even if we don't win. Just to come back to this theoretical model from earlier, the um, arcs, attention, relevance, satisfaction and confidence. Um, so the last two elements of that are, I think, specifically related to this idea of uh, success breeds confidence and a satisfaction um, gives us that reward. So holding the vision and the mindset. Um, this is the last part of Dernier's uh, process of motivation, and it's this idea of encouraging positive retrospective self-evaluation. And a very influential idea here, which I'm sure you are probably familiar with already, is Carol Dweck's uh, growth mindset coming from her book uh, from 2006, The New Psychology of Success, and a very interesting and influential TED talk. Um, the point of the growth mindset is this belief that um, that we can get smarter. It's not fixed um, innate ability. It's rather that um, with effort, we will all get better. And even if we're not there yet, um, we can get there. It's just a question of uh, spending a little bit longer um, and not not kind of um, feeling dis dis disheartened at all. And this relates to attribution theories of motivation. So with a growth mindset, um, we attribute our success to effort um, rather than innate ability. And this is really empowering and really, really powerful. So the motivational teaching idea number 10 is to help students to develop this growth mindset. And I think there are a number of different ways of doing this. First of all, uh, introducing them to the idea if, if they don't know it. Um, also to encourage risk taking, um, you know, the only mistake you can make is the one that you don't learn from. Um, perhaps you could use yourself as a model, talk about your language learning, talk about maybe um, the setbacks you might have had, um, but how you've maybe persevered and kept going. Um, you can have an interesting debate in with older learners about whether our skills are fixed or can be developed through effort. And that brings us to motivational teaching idea number 11. But I said there were only 10. Um, so yes, there are actually 11. I wanted just to surprise you. So the motivational teaching idea number 11 is to motivate yourself. Um, why? Uh, well, I think a motivated person is engaging. Um, and interesting to be around and inspiring. Uh, I think enthusiasm is infectious. And I think that curiosity uh, really drives innovation and new thinking. And certainly this year has, um, I think, been provoking many of us to think in ways that we, we hadn't thought before. Um, 
And coming back to this idea of engagement, um, so why why is this engagement idea so important that, that it's the holy grail of learning? Um, coming back to Zoltan Dernier again, um, he writes that um, motivation is great, certainly important, but it, it's not the be all and end all because unless we actually do something with our motivation, we're kind of in the same, the same position. Um, and he says, to be sure, motivation is undoubtedly necessary for preparing the deal. But engagement is indispensable for sealing the deal um, and actually putting something into action. So engagement, motivation plus implementation, which sometimes is the difficult part. So I would encourage you to explore your own teaching. Uh, one really great way of doing that is to work with peers, which I think is inherently motivating. Um, try out new things. And in the handout from this talk, um, I've, I've put the checklist, which is in Zoltan's book, um, and I've just taken a number of those and put that in the handout. Uh, and and it, he encourages you to just to try one out. OK, today I'm going to try this one out, uh, make notes on sort of how it how it went. Um, and also to be kind to yourself and recognise your own strengths as a teacher, because sometimes as teachers we are actually hard on ourselves. So finally, just to conclude here, uh, motivational quote number two, and this comes from an interesting book, The Organised Mind, um, which finishes with this uh, idea that the key to change is having faith that when we get rid of the old, something or someone even more magnificent will take its place. I think this can motivate us to to move on and make changes and do things differently. So that's the end of part three, and um, hopefully we have a couple of minutes for questions. And I'm just going to put this feedback form also up on the screen here so that you could give me some brief feedback when this finishes. Um, so Caroline and Lisa, are there? Uh, first of all, have we run out of time? And um, do we have time for maybe one or two more questions? Hi, Joe. Yes, we've got um, eight minutes uh, remaining on this session. So okay. I think um, we have got a couple of questions in the Q&A. Maybe Caroline would like to um, choose one for you. OK, sorry, I was muting muted. Um, yet yeah, we have a question which is how do it from Leslie saying, how do we know if we're overwhelming students with too much variety. Uh, we've talked about in, in including variety, but can there be too many platforms, too much variety? Leslie's asking. That, that's an interesting question. Um, I think one one good way is, is to ask the learners and to um, get feedback. And that can be as simple as asking them the question, what do you think? We've been using this platform, that this platform, this other one. Um, would you like to use other platforms too, or is that enough? Um, have you, you know, how are you finding the course so far? Um, are we going, are we going too fast, or are there other activities that you haven't liked? So, getting feedback regularly in many different ways is is really important. Just by talking to the students, or by giving them something a little bit more structured, like some kind of um, Google form or something like that. Um, I mean, it's it's. I think variety is really, really important that the brain has a novelty bias. So we, we're looking for the new and it, and it gives us a buzz and we do want it. But at the same time, um, and uh, that's one of the talks earlier today was about the power of habits. Um, we also know that, you know, younger children and, and perhaps up to many ages, this idea of routine as reassurance um, is also very powerful. So it's kind of like we do need routines and we do like routines, but within that routine, we also need this variety factor or we switch off and we become disengaged. And as soon as we're disengaged and switched off, uh, we're actually not taking stuff in and we're not learning. Um, so it's, it's a balance. I think definitely it's a balance. Um, I think probably going back to the learners and asking them is a good way to, to work out if what we're doing is is what they want. Thank you. Let's see me if there's a so one question which is um, general, very general. Um, asking saying somebody asking about effective ways, tips for pre preventing states of anxiety or boredom amongst students. It's, it's a big question, Jo. <laughs> um, but I mean, and you've obviously touched on a lot of that, but if there are any 
Any other thoughts you had on that? Yeah, it is a very big question. It's a big question anyway. I think right now at this um, this point in this pandemic and and with the um, the you know the socially distanced classroom, it's 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 even more important. Um, I mean, I think anxiety in general can be you know massively destructive in terms of learning because it's this whole thing about the effective filter and it means that we don't we don't take stuff in when we're in an anxious state. So it is really important that that you know that we're creating this pleasant environment where people are happy. And I think, uh, I mean, in a way, what I was uh, demonstrated badly at the beginning, I went too quickly. Um, and that kind of uh, makes people go, oh, you know, you need to slow down. So I think we need to have the right pace when we're teaching. And um, again, you know, students with additional educational needs, um, this is a particular factor that's important. So this whole idea of structuring the learning, breaking it down, making it into smaller steps and not moving on to the next step until really we're happy that, that people have, have mastered the step that they were at. And it's a good delicate balance because if we, if we go too slowly, there are also learners who will just not be engaged. To, so we need to strike the balance, but I think um, reducing anxiety is incredibly important. And I think right now, probably it's gonna be a lot about um, um, about encouraging dialogue, no, um, and addressing the whole sort of coronavirus fears to some extent, and and listening to to learners, and and sort of you know making sure that we do discuss the issues that they might be particularly worried about, so that um, you know we, we're aware of our learners and what what anxiety issues they're having, mm -hmm. um, and, and just encouraging that that pleasant classroom environment and and I think something Graham was saying earlier you know making sure that there's fun and there's time to socialize at the beginning there's time to chat um, and that there's plenty of moments for enjoyment and and things that aren't perhaps really high stakes so you know mm -hmm. uh, a quiz a game that kind of thing a song mm -hmm. okay indeed um, no more questions but a nice comment here from Flurry which probably helps us to to tie up here um she said no question but inspiring she's got she says definitely to be watched again the talk and to grasp take more from it um which is some nice feedback there at the end um maybe i don't know lisa yeah um actually i had a just a, a sort of comment on the previous um, question and maybe a comment for Joe as well. As you mentioned about um, preventing anxiety by balancing, finding a balance with the pace. And I thought about also a balance between, as you said, variety and yet routine, because we often find that um, the idea of having a routine uh, reduces anxiety, especially in younger learners. So perhaps it's a it's a case of us also as teachers finding a balance between maybe perhaps introducing our lessons with a, a set routine, which might be very valuable for these learners in this time where everything's quite uncertain and changing, um, but also f uh, adding that variety, as you said, later on in the lesson, possibly. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. I think uh, routine is reassuring. Habits are reassuring. Um, and one example there where you can sort of have a routine but have variety is this idea of a sort of student um, initiated presentation. So you have this routine every week. One of the students is going to give a presentation and they know that that's maybe the last 10 minutes of class. Um, but every time it's a new student. Um, so I found that that works really well with with sort of higher level learners, but it can work down with, you know, with learners with a sort of A2 level and above. Um, and, and just to, yeah, um, sort of set a, a set a, a calendar for when those students are going to be presenting so they've got plenty of time to think about it. Um, so, yeah, I think variety within routine is is important. Yeah, that's great, Jo. Thank you. Um, OK, so we're just coming to the end of uh, the talk now, the end of our time. Um, thank you again for a very informative talk. And uh, as you can see on the screen now, um, we've got uh, just a couple of instructions for you. The virtual hall, um, we'll paste the link into the question and answers now. Perhaps Caroline can help me with that. Um, some of you are asking about where you can find um, the slides and the handout that Joanna mentioned. Well, you can find it on the virtual hall Padlet. Um, we should have all of the speakers information and handouts available by Monday. 
So please remember to keep checking in there when you'll be able to find uh, the handout and the slides from this presentation. Um, if some of you would like to watch the presentation again, remember you just need to click on the Teams link, the same link that you clicked on to attend this session, and you'll be able to find a recording of the session where you can watch again or you can send it to anybody who wasn't able to attend today. Um, and just to remind you again that we are celebrating our 80th anniversary here in Spain. Um, so keep sending us um, your texts about inspirational teacher colleagues to Teaching Conference Spain at BritishCouncil.es or .org um, and we'll have some prizes for that. Okay, um, so thank you very much everybody for attending today. And um, remember now we have a lunch break and the next uh, talks will begin at 4 p.m. this afternoon. So we hope to see you back again this afternoon. Thank you very much and goodbye. Thank you very much. Goodbye.